What are your thoughts on Ozempic? Um, My neck hurts. Your neck hurts? Oh, good. Oh, well. Welcome to Howie Mandel Does Stuff. I'm Howie Mandel. I'm Jacqueline Schultz, his daughter. And we've got Dr. Mike here. You go by Dr. Mike, but your real name is Mikhail... Varshavsky. Varshavsky. Yes. Mikhail, but but Dr. Mike. Yeah, Dr. Mike is easier. Then... Then Mikhail, Mikhail Varshavsky, yeah. It, and uh, if you don't know, but you should know, you're probably the most uh, famous, the most followed, the biggest um, um, digital- medical influencer? Influencer in the medical field, sure. are you? Yeah, I would say that's fair. I also think- Second to Fauci, maybe. Yes. And Fauci's been on the channel, on the show multiple times. Right. We, we've hung out. Right. They invited me to DC to talk COVID with him. But what I will say is I used to think influencer is a bad thing for a doctor. Because influencer is like, oh, that's what entertainment people do and not medical professionals. Right. But then if you really think about it, I'm influencing people to have a healthy lifestyle. I'm influencing them to take their medications appropriately. So I'm an influencer. All doctors should be influencers. Well, you just influenced me. I'm convinced. <laughs> I'm convinced. But you're an entertainer. But not only that, you were also People Magazine's sexiest doctor alive. Yeah. That was not a title I saw coming in my nerdy high school days. Was that a... Do you... Uh, you're single, right? I'm single. So do you use that when you... Do you hi. think there's a lot of competition in the medical world? What does that even mean? I don't know. There's not that I many that's rude. sexy doctors. Well, no, like it's there, great. Well, there was that show, Doctors, <laughs> and uh, the previous host of it, Travis Stork, used to be The Bachelor. Oh, yeah. Yeah, no, you're right. So, so you're wrong. I'm wrong. So what are you saying? So I just, I'm introducing our guest <laughs> as the sexiest doctor alive, and you're Sorry. going, that's not a high bar? She's not. <laughs> welcome to my daughter. Sorry. That's okay. <laughs> I didn't mean it. I didn't mean it in a bad way. I just meant... She I, just said he's facts. not the world's We're sexiest model. Here. But being a, a single guy, an influencer, a doctor, are you uh, are you in the are you in a relationship right now? No, very much single. How, what is the difference between single and very much single? Are you on an app? Uh, very much single, looking to change it. I guess I should have said right. So single and looking, yeah, ready to mingle, if you will. Are you on a Are you on an app? Yeah, I'm on an app. No, Raya. I don't mean TikTok. Oh, Grinder. Ryan, <laughs> Raya. Oh, right. <laughs> okay. It's important to distinguish should, between the two. I, uh, yes, you don't want to mix them up. Correct. Okay, so you're on Raya. Raya is... Is Raya the place to find, like, a long-term... No. So you said you're looking for a relationship. <laughs> I just, didn't say uh, I was doing a, it successfully. <laughs> it's a hookup. They're doing you successfully. Oh, maybe. Yes, maybe. So um, I'm so glad you're here today. It's not like I have a lot of questions for you. I just don't know if you know anything about me. I'm a hypochondriac. Of so course. just to have a doctor in the room. is exciting. It's exciting and comforting. Okay. It really is. I do like uh, what you speak of. And I like what you, uh, you know, in, in doing research, I, I listen to your TED Talk. Mm. Your TED Talk kind of aligns with my uh, lifetime philosophy. He did a TED Talk in Monte Carlo. And he talked about, you know, we have this... Uh, issue with people thinking they know right yeah is that it the I, I know all expert yes and i'm i'm always of the belief that the smartest people in the world and the people you want to be around are the people that are aware of what they don't know yes instead of the people that think they know and aren't open to that mm -hmm. and especially in medicine yeah and uh because it is a mystery and it is a science and it is constantly evolving that must have been interesting when you were talking to fauci because he th that poor guy yeah. just got ravaged well i think what it really highlighted was that scientists are good at science not great communicators and we need to change that so i actually think we should bring some comedy into the medical school curriculum okay how do you how do you do that we need to start teaching improv two infected people walk into a bar <laughs> yeah there yes. you go what happens next? Well, bedside manner is something. When you take when you go to medical school, do they teach bedside manner? We have simulated patients, and that can be something as simple as... Is that as an inflatable sex doll? <laughs> <laughs> You're going to laugh because I'm actually going to tell you something quite similar. We oh. have simulated patients where you just interact with someone talking about their acid reflux. We also have simulated patients that you perform either a pelvic exam for a female or a prostate exam on a male. So imagine you have six student doctors in a room right. and they're all about to check a single individual's prostate and he will gauge your form. It's a living person. Living person. Volunteer. Volunteer. Well, I no, know. no, I think they get paid. For a finger in the ass. 
Multiple. I remember I remember a story Why? with my cousin who went to medical school and she got marked poorly on that exam because she did not cut her fingernails. Yes, they have a trimmer <laughs> there for you and they actually ask you to hold out your fingers. Yeah, well, they didn't do that with her. Oh, because, they should have, that's yeah. mean. But with a hangnail, you can, you, that's a twofer because you can do a uh, <laughs> like a, a prostate exam and a blood test at the same time. Oh no, you don't want that kind of blood. You don't. No, because then you're opening up to infection, there's E. coli in the region, you gotta be careful. I was just kidding. Uh, I'm, I get worried about stuff like that. <laughs> Are you practicing as a doctor? Correct, three days a week. You have a, a, a practice in New York? I work at a community health center. And what is your ex, what is your- Family medicine. So oh. primary care, preventive care, all the good stuff. Did you get COVID? Yeah. More Sadly. than once? Only once. Only once. Yep. And was it, did, did, was it hard for you or- Asymptomatic, you? caught it because I was actually gonna film with Mr. Beast for one of his videos. Yeah. And in preparing for travel, I checked, didn't even know I was sick, had it. Wow. Yeah. Okay. And w when you were you when you talked to Dr. Fauci, what mm -hmm. what did you learn that that, that y y uh, my take on it? And I don't have a take, and it became very political and very, very political. yeah, which is crazy that it even is a in that realm. But I always thought that, and this is what I took away from you, even your TED talk, is the fact that you know, for lack of a better term, you know, science is a guess. Right and 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 an educated guess, yeah. and you, uh, you guess if I do this, this might happen, and then it's an experiment, right? If you if you if you do this, well, the p hypothesis isn't the end goal, correct? So it's not really a guess once you're telling people what to do. The hypothesis, and then you do the experiment. So it's not really just an educated guess. It's making the best decision based on the limited information you have at the moment, right? So in some instances, your level of confidence will be much higher and your level of confidence will be higher. And we actually have levels of evidence. So for example, if a doctor tells you, hey, we've never done randomized controlled studies on something, but I think this works. That's called expert opinion, lowest level of evidence. Highest level is the gold standard, randomized controlled study, placebo control, double blind. The scientists don't know who's taking the sugar pill and, or not, and the participants don't know. That's the gold standard. But you can't do that in every instance. But, and then it also depends on the environment oh, that yeah. all this information is, is, is taken. And I took this also away from your, your TED talk. He talked about how um, there, there, was a, there is and continues to be a movement to uh, anti-vax because of the, the possibility of it causing autism. Mm -hmm. And you talk about like when people are scared, if you can raise a, a, you know, a red flag and they're scared because this person is a doctor, because this person apparently did a study, that just takes off like a snowball. Whereas what I learned from, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, what I learned from your speech is the doctor that first came up with this hypothesis, um, only studied 12 people, mm -hmm. was discredited, mm -hmm. and lost his license to practice. Correct. But the fact that he was discredited, the fact that it is only 12 people is kind of negligible because people don't know that. It's not even negligible on that account. It is already step one. But the step two is there have been studies since with hundreds of thousands of participants showing the exact opposite, that that relationship does not exist. So it's been not just that study that quote unquote fake proved it, but then there's been studies that said it does not exist with way more power, more power meaning more participants. So why is that not the, um, the accepted answer? I would say politics. I will say because of commercial power, because people are led to believe different theories, they're scared. There's psychology of influence that is weaponized at them. And what my goal has been on the YouTube channel from day one is to be as transparent as possible when talking about science. Like you mentioned my Fauci interview, what really made me respect him, they're not checking my questions before I interview him in DC. They're not asking for the footage afterwards. I could ask him anything I want, I have an hour with him. Go nuts. I mean, if someone has something to hide, they're asking questions in advance. They're not letting you put certain answers on the web. Here, it's ask me anything you want, go right ahead. And I challenged them. I said, why were we doing 
um, mask recommendation, uh, really poo pooing mask recommendations early on and then changing. Why are we not taking the same approach as the UK? Why? And he answers everything. He's not there to misguide. He's just not incredibly well trained on a mass level of communication. But that's a failure of our scientific education, not Dr. Fauci. Do you think it's also because people have lost trust in the pharmaceutical industry in general? And so they distrust literally everything yeah. now because it is a for-profit business in this country. So how are we going to trust that this is okay for us and good for us when we have distrust in general? Sure. Not everything for profit automatically becomes evil. Mm -hmm. Just how everything that is natural does not become safe. Cyanide, arsenic, natural, not safe. For profit, pharma, eh. But what's also for profit? Natural supplements, billion dollar industry. Why is no one approaching them with the same level of skepticism that they are the pharma industry when they're also a for profit billion dollar industry? With no oversight, at least pharma has to answer to the FDA, to the general public, has to conduct research. I can bottle up right now with some powder on this table right now, Mike's magic formula, sell it in a, in a pharmacy. No oversight, and I can make whatever claims I want, and only if someone gets hurt will the FDA step in. That's scarier to me than pharma having to do multi-million dollar research, show not just that the product works, to show how it works, to show the side effects, which population it works for, versus, oh, here, take this, it'll fix whatever's bothering you. I mean, how often do we see that on infomercials or social media or on TikTok? It's crazy. Mark so, Cuban calls that out all the time. All the time. I love that. I actually yeah. had Barbara Corcoran on my Shark Tank. Yeah. She said every medical uh, pitch that they've had on Shark Tank is all BS. She said that on the podcast. How does she know that? Because she sees the evidence for it. She's sharp. She knows. You as an influencer and also a, a medical expert, you must be approached constantly by, because even I am approached, mm -hmm. you know, as somebody who's- well, Why do you say even you? You're a mega star. You should be approached. Well, for the, OCD and stuff like that, or like uh, your heart- issues and but but because yeah. I have issues but what I'm saying is I would imagine that more comes toward you in the uh, expertise as as space. the expert uh, yeah. you know if you know they always say whether you're buying toothpaste you know nine out of ten uh, dentists agree yeah. so if Dr. Mike says that this is the best vitamin Dr. Mike says this is the best cold cure Dr. Mike says that's I would imagine you get offered a, a fortune to do these things though yeah. I don't see you Standing behind, as somebody who has, uh, what do you got, like 10 million on YouTube? We actually are hitting 11 million today, it's exciting. That's what I wanted to announce, congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> Just a, a roundabout way to say that. So with 11 million on YouTube, uh, how do you, why don't I see a lot of uh, brand integration? Well, we see, we have brand integration. I'm not anti business. No, no. I, I want to be financially successful. I want to be able to grow my team, reach a wider audience. This is all part of it. What I don't like is when doctors start making claims that something is better than something else with no evidence behind it. I've even been approached for some over-the-counter pain relievers and they're like, can you do an ad for it? I would never do that ad because I can't say one over-the-counter pain reliever is better than the other. It depends for who. I can do an educational thing, talk about its side effects, what it's good for, what it's not good for, but I can never make the recommendation because it's not something I would say in an exam room. If it's not something I'm comfortable saying to a patient, I'm not gonna be saying it on my social media. That's why you never say, people always ask you all the time what medications you're taking. Yeah, I heard you're you like, do that I'm not on Rogan. gonna do yeah. that. I, I really appreciated that you did that. Well, I'm not a doctor and I don't wanna be responsible. And I know that things that were recommended for me by a professional mm -hmm. have gone sideways. And that's yeah. why I, I loved your TED talk as far as, you know, and I didn't go to the doctor and say, you screwed up. Yep. I That was a, an, an educated um, direction. It's kind of like being lost on the road. You know, maybe if I turn right here, I'll get there faster. You know, it, it, you only have a certain amount of information to play with. Correct. And medicine, as much as it is a science and we say trust the science and all this thing, really it's an art as much as it is a science. Because you can go to multiple doctors and get three pieces of science advice that are all accurate, but art form wise, they may not be right for you or they may not be right for your situation, or you may not vibe with the provider and therefore not trust the science. How do you feel about WebMD? Pros and cons. 
you won't, you're such a, you should be a politician. (laughs) No, because if you, I I think of everything risk versus benefit. That's how I make every recommendation. Whether it's, I'm talking about therapy, a medication, a surgery, even a supplement. It's all pros and cons. And when I look at WebMD, I could see that it raises anxiety in so many of my patients. They type in headache, they see the word tumor, that's all that's in their head, not pun intended. But when you are looking and you're trying to gauge information on what you should ask your doctor to make yourself an educated uh, patient, to arm yourself with knowledge, I love it, that's great. But it really depends who's using it and how they're using it. So I actually guide my patients and they say, should I go on Google, should I look it up? Some patients that say, yes, use it to arm yourself to ask the specialist better questions. Some patients that I know that have an incredible high level of anxiety that will be derailed by WebMD, I say, stay off of it. Here's the only two things that I want you to look up. Here are the sources and nothing else. You should you should start a, a little site, Second Opinion MD. I think that probably <laughs> exists. Does it? Yeah, I wouldn't oh, be surprised. I thought I had a good idea. <laughs> How, uh, what is your And a th- lawyer probably owns it. <laughs> yes. What are your thoughts on Ozempic? Um, it's a prescription medication that is used to delay gastric emptying, which aids in weight loss and treatment of diabetes. Right. And what do you, how do you feel? Like, do I have emotions about Ozempic? Uh, what, I, what I'm, uh, that doctors, it seems to be, and maybe I know you're, you're in New York, but here in LA. No, every, New York, it's a hot thing too. Oh, okay. So celebrities so, are rushing to get it. It's not only celebrities, but it's just Well, people, people who are in front of a camera. Are the people that we hear about, yeah. but even I know people and people in, in your school and things like that, like other parents and things like that. My school. Oh, my kid's school? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Well, she's a, she was a teacher. <laughs> but but what I'm saying is people I know that just want to lose five pounds, they're not on uh, television, they're not modeling, um, are jamming themselves with Ozempic. And it. I know somebody who's not on TV that went to a doctor, a female, mm-hmm. went to their general practitioner mm-hmm. and said, uh, if you want some Ozempic, you know, I'll give you a little prescription. They, they didn't even, they, this was enough to uh, maybe make somebody start to uh, get an eating disorder because they weren't even asking for it. So it's being offered. So my couple of questions about Ozempic is, are these companies offer, I find that the doctors are shelling it out. Are you get, do you get a a kickback? No. Absolutely? Absolutely not. So the sale, pardon me? Illegal. Stark laws are already in effect to prevent that from happening. There's what? They're called Stark Laws. Explain to me what that is. Um, it's basically a law that prevents doctors from profiting, profiting off of the prescription of medications, owning a lab and sending the patients only to this lab, um, sending them only to a specific subspecialist that they get kickbacks from. There's rules in place against this. There is no benefit to a doctor prescribing anything. There is. Uh, it's secondary benefit from patients coming to see them and paying out-of-pocket costs to see them. And if they can create a business surrounding that and saying, oh, if you go see Dr. X, Dr. X will give you whatever you want. You'll pay whatever the fee Dr. X charges you. I saw a video that you made about the dangers of also really wealthy people and their mm-hmm. health care not being great because of this issue and going to concierge services and because they're able to... Um, do what you're saying and there's not as many regulations. Yeah, so if you look at it, our healthcare system is messed up on both ends. The bottom part of our socioeconomic ladder, people struggle to get access to care. They can't afford their medications. They can't see doctors because they don't have insurance. But then on the other end, they also get really bad health care because they think they can buy health. You cannot buy health. You cannot, with billions of dollars, say, I want to make sure I never die. I want to live forever. Hyper optimization does not exist in healthcare, no matter what medical doctor, social media influencer tells you, the enemy of good in healthcare is trying to be perfect because the body's job is to stay in balance and homeostasis. And the second you're going into hyper-optimization, that's an extreme, the body will have a pushback effect and you'll have side effects. Therefore, the body does not like hyper-optimization. Which an example is like juicing a juice cleanse or? Um, like what, when people say, oh, if you take TRT, you'll be faster, stronger, leaner, and everyone should be on TRT. Well, hold on a second. That's hyper-optimization. Yes, if you have low testosterone because of hypogonadism, which is how we uh, call it in medicine, then you should consider taking TRT. Hypogonads? Gonadism. Because, like gonads? Yeah, because the gonads produce <laughs> testosterone. So Where if you are have your that gonads? Low, 
You're nuts. Where are you? <laughs> right? I'm putting it in layman's that terms was good. for my yeah. daughter. It's hard to talk to your daughter about your nuts. Birds and bees. <laughs> okay, we're in a commercial, and you are wearing. You have. <laughs> Guess do. what she has? Her shady race. Hey, 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 Kenny, Kenny, Kenny. Kenny's trying effects by putting sunglass effects on the screen. You, you know what? Remove the effect. Remove the effect. There. You could see her shady race. <laughs> What? That's a really high tech effect we have going on yeah, there. Yeah, I don't know what he's doing. Kenny's really good at this. He's not good at this. Yeah. Kenny, <laughs> remove the effect. Tell him about Shady Rays. Well, Go you ahead. could take on the sun with gear built to last. Our friends at Shady Rays have the. <laughs> <laughs> You're laughing at Kenny. Kenny, she's just laughing. I'm going to tell you, Shady Rays are great. They're they're affordable. They have a money back guarantee. If you lose your Shady Rays or you uh, damage your Shady Rays, you return them and they will give you your money back. Uh, besides all that, um, they also, every purchase supports the Shady Rays Impact Program, which works directly with nonprofits and their communities to empower and make adventure accessible for all walks of life. She's laughing at Kenny, who's trying uh, low. <laughs> Kenny, you can go buy filters. You can go do things. Can they you don't tell, have to do stand there. Do you think there. they could tell that they're polarized too? They're premium polarized, which is cool. And they're super affordable. Yes, and That's they're better than what you're looking through. Those aren't, <laughs> this is just a bad filter that... Uh, that uh, Kenny put in front of him, but they are great to wear outside. Go Plus, ahead. Plus, Shady Rays has the most insane protection plan mm -hmm. ever, where if they break or anything, which they don't. You know, don't. I already said that. I, no, I know. Okay, go ahead. Oh, no, I didn't know you said it for this ad. I know that you've said it before. No, we're, when you were laughing at <laughs> Kenny's uh, beautiful- I just think it's super important to know that they have an amazing protection plan. They do, but what's more important <laughs> is they go, lift the, the filter. <laughs> the, how do you get them, you're asking? Go to ShadyRays.com and use the code Howie for 50% off two or more pairs of polarized sunglasses. Try for yourself the shades. Try them. They're rated five stars by over a quarter of a million people. I don't like these special effects that you do, Kenny. I say I don't like it and you put it on, back to the show. <laughs> okay. So if I have hyper gonads, if I have uh -huh. hyper nuts, uh -huh. if I have like, go ahead. Hypo, no. hypo nuts. Hypo nuts. Uh -huh. I'm sorry. Not enough testosterone. Well, hyper nuts are, it's hard for me to concentrate on them for long, uh, portions of time. Or maybe it's like restless leg syndrome, but with your nuts, like they don't stop moving. I'm afraid we're entering the, the <laughs> sphere of medical medicalness. <laughs> <laughs> okay. It's just, it's, it's just time, it's just time that uh, it is a parent you wouldn't know to sit your kid down and talk about. <laughs> Makes sense. Crazy nut stories. Okay, but go ahead, TRT. It's, no, but uh, it's just like TRT is an example of people wanting to become faster, stronger, and or they say, you know, go into a cold plunge for this exact amount of time, follow this exact regimen, because this is the thing that's going to improve your life and cure disease X, Y, Z. It's not true. Is a cold plunge good for you? If you like it. <laughs> if you like the challenge. But medically, I'm never going to recommend to my patient ever in my life as a physician to go do a cold plunge. Why? Or like cryotherapy. Isn't that like the same? Yeah, well, why? I'm asking you why. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know why people are recommending it. There's no evidence to say it really does anything valuable and it's expensive. It's time consuming. Most patients do not live in this world that they can afford to buy a tub, throw ice in it every day. Like it just, it's not about, this is the difference between people who are excited about information and are researchers versus someone who's a clinician and actually sees patients and the hard time they're having in their everyday lives. And then I'm going to come in there and be like, oh, in my fancy suit, I'm going to tell you to get a cold plunge. And if you do it for three minutes and not three minutes, 13.4 seconds, you fail. It's not real. There's no evidence. It doesn't exist. Well, without being that uh, specific about whatever, you have to stay there for three minutes. Is there any upside aside from mental uh, a challenge that you feel like you've- I haven't seen anything in the evidence that shows me that it's very worthwhile. Okay. The caught, remember I do everything caught like risk benefit. Okay, Ozempic, well, let's stay on that. Yeah. To lose weight, to lose yeah. five pounds. How yes. do you feel about that? It's not what it's intended use is. 
And why that's dangerous is because when a medicine is studied by this evil pharma that we're talking about, it's studied in, in a certain population, people for Ozempic as an example, people who have type two diabetes, who are overweight or have high blood pressure or uh, some kind of heart disease, it's studied in those people. So when you're taking it as someone who doesn't have any of these diagnoses and you take it, how do I know that the risks you're facing are going to be what the ones that we found in the research when we didn't test it on people like you? It's the same reason why we suck at treating women's heart disease because we never did research on women's heart disease. So when, when a, a female patient comes in and says, oh, I have a little acid reflux, maybe a little arm pain, we discount it and they're having a heart attack because our initial research were, were, was not done on women. It was done on men who said, I have an elephant sitting on my chest. This is how I describe it. And that's how our common knowledge is of heart disease. And therefore we miss all these heart attacks in women. Same thing. We have to know who the research was done on to decide whether or not Ozempic is safe for losing five pounds in an average healthy person. We don't know. Uh, the other question is, what about all this uh, kind of enhancement, like Botox? Mm. But that, that sounds scary to me, uh, yeah. about in just injecting that into your system. Yeah, snake venom. Yeah. How, how do you feel about that? I think that's a personal decision that's used usually for looks. Uh, there are some indications for Botox to be used in other medical uses. For uh, migraines, right? Migraines. There's also some for dystonia, which is when someone has really tight muscle tone, especially elderly people. Sometimes they get that in their neck or in maybe a severe Parkinsonism. So there are indications where Botox could be very beneficial in some patients for medical use. But then the cosmetic use, that's not for me to judge. That's for someone to decide if they want that for themselves. Isn't there something to be said where a healthy person is typically a happy person and if you do Botox and it makes you happier, like whether it's a placebo or whatever, then you're going to be healthier, right? Isn't it's hard to your, say. Your state of mind also equals your physical well-being. Okay, your second part of your statement is true. So if your physical state is good, that can affect your mental well-being. But it doesn't mean that we can shortcut it and jump to the next statement that you said that if Botox gets you there, you should do Botox. Because there could be some people that get addicted to Botox, which happens. Some mm -hmm. people develop body dysmorphia where they get so much of it that it actually starts damaging their muscle tissue, their muscle atrophies. They have side effects. They run out of money, so they start going to low-cost clinics. They start getting infections. And that's how that recommendation really fell apart really fast. Wah, wah, wah. <laughs> <laughs> Medicine isn't always sexy. That's, that's no, it's not it. always sexy. Speaking of which, you, you, uh, we are always getting, we have a friend, uh, she has a friend, Natasha, who's a nurse. And living in Hollywood, we, we constantly get bombarded by offers. And I, I guess good health is thought to be, or, or looking good call it call her up she sent us a um a um a text wait let me make sure that she's available because okay. she's with clients usually mm. and i want to know what you think of this i but, could read you to the text yeah. first okay you, read, read, text? read him the text and i want to hear what he thinks of this and this is not a, a, a by any means we didn't solicit this because you were going to be here in fact we didn't answer it until you were here okay cool because we were doing another podcast with somebody that uh she just messaged me and said, free pelvic floor strengthening and vaginal tightening treatment. We are giving out at our new Beverly Hills. I'm not going to say the doctor. Um, this Monday for anyone that wants to try it, it's a $3,000 service for free. Anyone you know that wants it, which like I was a little offended because how does she know that my vagina needs tightening? Your dad is in the room. <laughs> Please don't but yeah, but, uh, she's don't constantly sending me like, Marketing pitches like that. Yeah. Well, you, for, they get for like you in vaginal the door. rejuvenation. And they get you like in the that. door, but you're going to fall right out. It's loose. So <laughs> the wide opening. <laughs> the same way that they prey on your fears, which you talked about earlier from my TED talk, is the same way that they prey on your insecurities. And they try and find whatever the most common insecurity is in people. And then they use their marketing approach from there. I wasn't insecure about my vagina. If Don't you stop pull saying <laughs> vagina. <laughs> Why are you afraid of the word vagina? He's uh, you're you came out of one. Yeah. And know, you went in but one. My, <laughs> because I'm I'm in the same room as my daughter. Oh, fair. Is that fair? That you is, wouldn't know. You don't have kids yet, but I'm fair. telling I've delivered you. kids. Is that an amazing thing? Amazing. 
Are you allowed to? Don't you have to be? <laughs> what do you mean? Are you allowed, allowed to? <laughs> cab Don't you drivers. have to be an OBGYN? Family cab? medicine practices OBGYN. Oh, they do. Okay. Cab, cab but drivers. But why did I go? I had to switch my OB because she wasn't an OBGYN so that I can deliver a baby. Some people choose what they want to practice. Oh, so she chose to not help me? She may have chosen to <laughs> practice GYN. You're so annoying. Me? That's how annoying <laughs> you are. That's how annoying you are. Go to somebody else. Well, no, because it's actually really hard to be, like if you're doing OBGYN, you have to do obstetrics and gynecology. But obstetrics means that if you have patients who are scheduled to deliver in a specific week, for the four weeks before and four weeks after, you have to make sure that you're within an hour of the hospital or that you have coverage, that you're not drinking alcohol in case that you need to go and you need to have a delivery. So. Yeah, that, that didn't happen with me. She was at a party when I went into labor. Mine. <laughs> uh, you're an MD, right? Dio. Which is a there's osteo two types osteo correct. There's two types of doctors in the United States. Right. Dio's MDs both do four years of medical school and then a residency of their choice. Now they've merged the residency program, so we're all training together. But there is a uh, kind of a uh, the MDs are. Kind it used of to be. It's fading critical now. Critical of osteo. W no. W what is it called? No. Osteopathy? Osteopathic medicine. Yes. So before there used to be some competition. In fact, if you really look at the history, there was at one point that the MD institution offered to switch the DO degree of everyone who graduated as a DO to swap their degree to MDs. And actually the DOs pushed back against that and said, no, we want to keep our independence as DOs. Because we do learn some extra things like the holistic care model to be a little bit more focused on the entire body, um, some more hands-on manipulation and things we do. So it's a slightly different education curriculum, but I will say over the last 10 years, it's become very similar. What is the biggest uh, uh, mistake that people are making right now um, with their own health it, that, um, is there an overlying, uh, it's probably all these supplements and things that they're buying and commercials and yeah, doing like their the, own. Looking for the quick fix. But I will say the biggest thing that we as a society is we're under valuing is sleep. Really? And that sounds super boring. Cause it's like, do you get eight, hour, eight hours a yes. night? How do you do that? Like, are you not rule? You have to do it. No, but your mind, how do you control your mind? It's, I, I would like to be able to fall asleep for eight hours. Is it, do you have a method? Are you, are you taking uh, Ambien or something? No, no, I don't take any medications like that. You just naturally fall asleep? Sometimes, I mean, there are times where I don't sleep eight hours because I couldn't fall asleep. I was anxious or I was upset about something that happened that day. We also need to be okay with that. There's a lot of people who create pathology out of their normal emotions. Like they're anxious because something that's anxiety provoking is happening and they think that that's a problem. I looked up other um, beauty things that people primarily in LA and in Hollywood are doing mm -hmm. um, snail mucin facials. Have you seen that on no. TikTok? It's a big thing where you buy snail mucin. Some people are- What even is mucin? The, the, the mucus, the of, mucus a of a snail. Mm. And mm. they're putting that all over their face. How do you get a snail to hock a loogie? No, you just, no, no. Maybe you squeeze, do you kill the snails? Not no? my field. Okay, how about There's <laughs> like if you look historically, we've done some weird stuff in the history of medicine. Like lobotomies used to be a thing to treat people's headaches, to treat mental health conditions. It was one of the saddest eras of like neurosurgery. And that's ever. not that long ago. That's, that's like, not like 19, early 1900s. Right. And that was terrible. We were literally destroying people's brains mechanically, like tearing them apart with no evidence that it works. And it was a terrible time. So like Obviously, snail mucus is not nearly as problematic as that, but snake oil is not new. It's been around. There's been promises of all sorts of weird stuff in the history of medicine. Is there a miracle drug that, or-, or I wish. I think sleep. I would just, no, it's not even, that's not miraculous. Like right. it, if you sleep eight hours, does it mean you're never gonna get cancer? No. Uh, my doctor says he's always amazed that he doesn't give a cancer diagnosis as anybody leaves with billions of cells. You know, exactly. Constantly firing and like it's amazing that at any given time you don't have cancer. Yeah. How about baby foreskin facial? No. Where are they getting it? From babies, from babies. foreskin. Yeah. Jewish babies. Yeah. And where do they get that? Jews. It's always from the Jews. <laughs> <laughs> Is there a store for that? Like what's happening in that no, establishment? It's a bris. It's a bris. You go to a yeah, bris. Yeah, but where do they, like do they hoard it? Is someone 
collecting biohazard baby foreskin? Yeah. That's my question. Not whether it works. That is a good question. Yeah. I don't we'll, know. Uh, we'll look at the comments. <laughs> I do. I do. But I heard from my doctor that now they're coming out with a blood test that can detect cancer cells and pretty accurately tell you where it, it may be in your body. Have you heard of that? I heard some preliminary stuff. Nothing yeah. usable right now. Right now, it's still future. Okay. Like that's for everything. Whether or not someone's pitching you a whole body scan to find cancers early, I'm not a fan of any of this stuff. You're not a fan of a body scan because a lot of people are going for that body scan. A lot of people are talking about it. And and I, I hear people who said they went for the body scan and they were able to detect something early where they had no symptoms and they saw something and caught it. Why, why are you anti-scan? Okay, so this is a pretty dense conversation because you can get into a lot of nitty gritty here, but let's just take it on its face value. Um, when we recommend doing like, let's get CAT scan out of it because CAT scan has radiation. That's very obviously bad to constantly radiate people. Right. But like, let's talk about MRI body okay. scans. Right. There's actually indications where if a patient has specific genetic conditions that they have really high risk for cancer, we do recommend MRI body scans. But for the average healthy person that doesn't have those conditions, scanning things does not yield better outcomes. And a lot of times you'll also, also always find some lump, bump, or thing that has of no significance that then you're gonna have to pursue and either scan again every six months or go in and biopsy and now risk having a side effect from the biopsy and downstream medical effects where just scanning and letting it be like just not scanning and letting it be would be the better choice. So again, when we make our recommendations, it comes from the fact that if I know I scan, you know, a million people that more people are going to benefit from this than get harmed. I don't have that data from MRI body scans. I have that for people who are hereditary high risk of cancer. There's specific conditions where people have really high risks of cancer. And those people we do MRI body scans. I like the way you, I, I like just the way you operate probably in life and in professionally because you, you're not, um, I think that people are kind of um, drawn toward uh, the um, alarmist because that's mm -hmm. kind of louder and more noticeable. And I like a doctor who is, Anti-alarm, mm -hmm. you know? So and I'm anti-thinking that aging is a disease. Everyone wants to be an anti-aging doctor. Everyone wants to live longer forever. I don't think aging is a disease. I think testosterone dropping 1% normally after a certain age is part of aging that is natural. It shouldn't be viewed as a disease. But uh, you're... Uh, I don't know that anybody's anti-aging. They're yeah, anti- yeah, they they're, they're, Absolutely. <laughs> but they're anti-looking like they're aging. Why? Because we are, um, be as an influencer, young man, mm -hmm. the sexiest doctor alive, mm -hmm. I, I think <laughs> that we are, that, that is held up and supposedly influencing us on how we should look. Regardless of the fact that they're looking at somebody in their 30s or their 20s or whatever you were at that age, you know, that's what somebody wants to look like. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I haven't done any work and I won't do any work, but I understand. You should with your eyes. But anyway, <laughs> but that's a different issue. But <laughs> no, because I do have an issue. Oh, my like, eyes. Oh, it's not, it's not about looks. My, the, the skin, it's hard for me to open the, my oh, eyes okay, when like, I'm tired. Aptosis. What? Aptosis. Told you. Yep. <laughs> What is that? Well, it just means like one eyelid does not open as high as the other because like, But it's the skin it. above it's the skin above my eye at night sometimes it gets pretty and then I can't even open mm. my I can't open my so eye. So it's a functional thing. Yeah, not to look younger. Got it. But I think looking young, looking attractive is um what we're sold. And we're just sold as a culture to look young and to look attractive. And if you look attractive and you look young, supposedly you'll be happier. And if you look young and you look attractive, you'll be more successful. So that w just the, um, the result of aging takes away whatever the perceived good look is. So it's the perception of others. That That's our society. About. I'm not, I, you know, I have a shaved head. I don't have, I'm not wearing just for men. You know, my beard is white, but I'm saying pre predominantly that's yeah, how so people. I, like there is an industry for this and I'm not against this industry existing. I'm just saying as a medical person, I'm not getting into that because my idea is to keep your body healthy 
and to help guide you through life as healthy as possible, but not to change the way you look because it's going to impact your health. Like I draw a line there. So you're a kid now, really. But when your hair turns gray, will you? Uh, will I mean, you my dye hair it? is gray. I have a lot of grays. I used to dye, and then I gave up. Right, but see, you were willing to put a chemical in your body but not, for your look, but not medically. I, I did not but, think that but had you, a medical. But, but you affect yourself. Medically. Sure. And I work out because I like to look healthy. I like to look younger and maintain it. But once you start thinking that you can hack this process or completely reverse this process is where it fails. No, but you feel that you've slowed it down. Yeah, you can. But it's not anti-aging. What? I think that's semantics. It I is. don't think so because those people are looking to cure aging. And I don't think we need to cure aging. Like Nobody gets out alive. Well, Everybody's going to die. Yes. So the idea of the testosterone dropping, let's focus on that because we talked about TRT earlier. They would say after the age of 30, 35, your testosterone starts dropping 1%. So some people will recommend that you should start fixing that and give yourself the testosterone as if it never stopped dropping. That's their idea of anti-aging. I disagree. I think it's appropriate for your testosterone to drop as you age. That's the philosophical difference. Do you, if you add the testosterone, if you've dropped the testosterone and then you use testosterone and an additive, mm -hmm. do you feel physically better? It's not proven. Uh, but you, you have, uh, when you add testosterone, uh, you- it Libido can change. Yeah, so your sex but drive- the energy levels, the cognitive issues, those things that people frequently want to take testosterone replacement for with normal testosterone levels, do not, have not been proven to change by taking TRT. Hmm. But you know what has been proven? Mm -mm. Increased risk of heart attacks of young people taking testosterone replacement therapy when un unnecessary. Uh, those folks losing their ability to conceive p potentially for life permanently. Uh, gonadal shrinking, ball back shrinking. To, we're back, back to, to the, the gonads. gonads. Back to the gonads. Prostate cancer increases. Well, if you take any hormones that your body isn't making on its own doesn't that have increased risks in general it can but if you are really low in those hormones because of a disease state mm -hmm. now the benefits change remember again we're going yeah. back to the benefits and risk thing because you are so low in it you're out of that normal we need to bring you back to normal by giving you the hormone but now giving you more boosting you immune boosting energy boosting now you're getting into a place of another extreme where your body's not good now you're going to get all the side effects can I ask you a question as a parent? No who questions. Takes, who takes no. my ahead. kids to like their yearly annual mm -hmm. checkups and stuff. Mm -hmm. Why don't they do blood tests for kids? At like their yearly annual checkups to make sure everything's good. Uh, well, the idea of doing blood tests just to see if everything's good does not work. We don't have all the answers. By doing all the blood tests, we do not. Like, so you're asking why don't they screen for conditions? Yes, if you're going every, I mean, it doesn't make sense to me that I go in and they look and they make them cough and like look in their throat and they're like, all right, you're good for another year. Like what was- It seems like a pediatrician just basically gives you your place on your chart. They weigh you if they don't see anything. It doesn't seem like well, they're going any Well, we do some deeper. blood work sometimes. There are indications for some blood work for screening. For example, if I have a 10 year old come in mm -hmm. and they have a very strong history of high triglycerides that run in the family or high cholesterol that runs in the family, early heart disease, I'll, I'll check them with the mm -hmm. lipid profile to see if they have uh, familial hypercholesterolemia, which is a, a condition where they have really high cholesterol and they can have a heart attack in their 40s. So we do check in some cases. There's also times where we check uh, hemoglobin or hematocrit, lead levels. There's like all instances where we do check. But on average, there's no value to just check a healthy person. Because if you have a child who's anemic, let's say, mm -hmm. they will show symptoms of anemia. Right. So the idea of checking average healthy people, that's called screening. And there are some instances where we do screening, pap smear, screening, colonoscopy, screening. We're taking everyone, no matter what they're, they're like, whether or not they have symptoms or not, that's screening. We do blood tests also for diagnosis, where you have a symptom, like you're fatigued, you're tired, you look pale. Now I'm going to give you a blood test to diagnose you with anemia. That is no longer screening. So you're talking about screening, and we do not see the value in screening healthy people for most blood tests, especially kids. Answer your question? Yeah, I have one other question. And also those blood tests, a lot of <laughs> times <you're> here. <laughs> will come up with some things that are like slightly off because they happen to be that day that they're off. And now we're doing another whole investigation where your child again has no symptoms. And there's no better example of this with thyroid levels. 
for some reason, some of my residents that I train, young doctors, they'll like get a thyroid level on patients. And I'm like, why'd you get a thyroid level? Like, oh, I thought it was a normal lab I should get on everybody. So they have a healthy person. They check their thyroid level. It's slightly off. Should I give them thyroid hormone now? The no, level is low, but, but the should, patient's fine. So, but, but what you should do, and correct me if I'm wrong, then you should follow up and have them take another thyroid level. That's a good, that's a good idea. You check it again and it's again low. Okay. So do we treat the person? I don't know. I'm not a doctor. Well, why are you like asking me? Logic wise, <laughs> forget the doctor thing. You don't need a degree for this hypothetical. So, but I don't know what- Logically low speaking, they have low thyroid on the test. It makes, you should treat. That's what people do. They're like, oh, your level's low. Here's a treat. And now you have symptoms of hyperthyroidism. And now you have palpitations. You're anxious. And I, it's my fault that I gave you the thyroid thing. You were fine. But now I'm treating the lab value, not the patient. You treat the patient, not the lab value. Makes sense. Makes sense. Wow. You're smart. <laughs> you should be a doctor. Yeah. <laughs> You're actually very good. And yeah. you have a theory that, that this I don't- This isn't a theory, by the way. This is what we're taught in medical school. It just gets so corrupted I by commercial success and everything that no one talks about this. Like, it sounds like I'm saying something groundbreaking, revolutionary. Every single professor, every single doctor that might not be good as a communicator or in media says this stuff, but you'll never hear it because the people that get your attention are the people that are really good communicators and snake oil salesmen and people who pitch marvelous products. Listen, I'm almost 70 years old. I love my doctor. My doctor is actually really good, but I find him not to be the norm. He's closer to what you do, mm -hmm. but I can't tell you how many times I've gone to just a regular doctor who has- Or mom's doctors. Uh, pardon me? Mom's doctors. Yes, who, <laughs> who is scanned, who has taken blood, who has treated something like I didn't know. Oh, you know, look at my blood work came back. I'm get, doing this. They've put me on a supplement. They've done, I just think that that is more the norm for the average person than what you speak of. Even though what you speak of is right. And I think that people listening to this podcast should listen to you. And um, I don't think people are self-advocate yes, uh, enough to go like, okay, I'm taking a blood, why am I taking a blood test? Like, what do you, wh wh why, what do you think? I don't feel bad. Why are you giving me yes. a blood test? Uh, or uh, uh, you know what? My doctor recommended I go in and I get a scan. Why am I getting- I think more people feel comfortable with those doctors that respond and do those scans and respond to them because feel a lot safer. of time they feel safer. And a lot of times doctors, probably not you, will write a patient off. They come in with a problem or an issue, like you're fine, it's in your head, go get rest, go eat health, like just write them off. So I think they feel like they're being heard and seen and taken care of, right. even if that's not the issue. You're right. Or and even more importantly, if I go someplace and I get a scan, then I gotta come back to your office and have another appointment for what you <laughs> get paid for. Right, so mm -hmm. it's a business, and they have to make money, and the overhead, and the insurance. In just being a doctor, they're selling false certainty in an uncertain world, in an uncertain science. If you ask me right now, like you, you're not my patient, but if a patient of mine sitting there during a regular annual physical that they're not due for a screening, asks me, doctor, do I have cancer? I can check them. I can explain they don't have signs of cancer. I don't suspect cancer. Can I, with 100% proof, say they don't have cancer? Impossible. But they'll go to a doctor and they'll scan them up the wazoo to give them a level of certainty slightly higher than mine, potentially risking their health in other areas. But they'll do that because they're making money. Where is the wazoo? <laughs> I think it's a musical instrument, isn't it? Yes. I have no idea. Isn't a wazoo a thing? I think that's a kazoo. Oh, kazoo. Yeah, I always get I'm an immigrant, sorry, at an English second language. Do you, it's it right is, around, do you speak Russian? Yeah. You can still speak fluently? Because yeah, yeah. you speak came here as a father. child. Yeah, I came when I was six. He's a doctor too, right? Correct. And he went to medical school, not just in Russia, but in the States and did residency again in his 40s, in a new language. So I could never say it was too hard. That's wow. what Natasha's dad, the one we were just talking to, her dad's from Russia mm. and was an engineer and then had to come here and do all his schooling over again. Wow. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Oh, I do have it. So I downloaded this app okay. <laughs> and I am now obsessed with it. It's, I don't know if I should say the name of the app, but what it does is it scans your foods and products and tells you whether there's hazardous additives and stuff in there. Oh, you ha a, you already a, have a reaction. So what's your reaction? On it. <laughs> are you shitting on the app or are you shitting well, on the there? Um, give me the an example of what, it, like, like what's an additive that it, warns you about. Okay, I will tell you. Is there I mean, if you just eat a whole food, like what? don't eat TV dinners and you'll be good. 
that's your that's your recommendation for eat long whole foods. Of, so for example like if you eat a piece of chicken and you eat some fruits and you eat some veggies you don't need the app right but it's telling you that like like if you eat sour gummy worms and you're scanning it with the app i think you're doing something wrong it's wait no <laughs> <laughs> what what it was telling me you don't like sour gummy worms. I just if you think that there's nothing artificial or added to <laughs> right. sour gum. Like, well, it was also wait, they're for not like, natural sour. It gum wasn't worms? just food. It was also for products like shampoo and conditioner and stuff and what additives they're putting in yeah, there. Yeah, I, I don't like that. You don't like it? No, because it, it gives people uh, like a scare. It's also why I don't like the whole California Proposition 65 thing being thrown around everywhere. You seen wait, that what's label? That? No, I don't even know if I'm saying the number right, but it's like you'll see like there's a cancer warning in this hotel because the furniture. I can't believe you've never seen this oh yeah i have yeah isn't it called proposition 60 maybe i don't look know. it up is it uh, got, somebody there is gonna i saw it at it disneyland up. okay so anyway <laughs> this thing is like ubiquitous it's all over every piece of furniture yeah. it's it's in everything that you buy and i think this is the worst thing of public health it's our biggest miss of Here public it is. health. that's it right there what proposition is the? 65 oh, okay. requires california to publish a list of chemicals known to cause cancer birth defects or other reproductive harm. This list, which must be updated at least once a year, has grown to include approximately 900 chemicals since it was first published in 1987. Yeah, so because of this, all of these furniture pieces, all the hotels have to have this little plaque that says the chemicals were used in the building of this product or this hotel, whatever. And now because it's everywhere, no one pays attention to it. It's why you've never seen it despite being in California. And you know what that's called? It's a proven medical principle, alarm fatigue. Why in the ICU, if there's an alarm going off and we don't think it's important, we turn it off right away? Because the last thing you want is people in the ICU to get comfortable with an alarm going off and not acting. So the more warnings you get like that, that you start ignoring, you start playing out the boy who cried wolf in real life. So what is the, what's the answer to Stop that? Stop scaring people by saying that there's chemicals and things when the chemicals are not directly impacting their life. Because if you just like, warn people about everything, life is cancer, it becomes very scary to live in that world. Or you start ignoring it and just living in that world and then you don't take any action about it. Warning should only come with action. Otherwise, you're just scaring people for no reason. Is there a value for you going to a hotel, <laughs> the one hotel, <laughs> here in Los Angeles, has a plaque that says some of the bu building materials that were built in this building have cancer causing harm. Is there value to that plaque in your mind? What action do you do? Do you not stay at the hotel? I well, for know. me using this app, the action that I take, especially with my kids, is if one brand says it doesn't have hazardous additives, I'm not talking about sugars, sodium, all that other stuff. I'm talking about like whatever the hazardous additive that they said it has in it, but another brand that gives me the same chicken nuggets mm -hmm. doesn't have those hazardous additives. I will choose the that healthier, other brand. The healthier brand. That's okay. That's okay. I mean, <laughs> you like, eat healthy? I mean, not really. Not all the time. I try and eat healthy. I'm human too. Do you like sweets? You know what I ate for breakfast this morning? No. Mm. Donuts. Wow. Mm. Apparently there's a good donut place around here. I forgot the name of it, but I had it this morning. Sidecar. Oh, yeah, I like, it we is. love sidecar. Yes. <laughs> so, Did you like it? Yeah, it was amazing. And and you recommend that to cure no. cancer? No. No. <laughs> but guess what? If you come to my office, I'm not going to judge you because you had donuts. I'm going to explain to you the risks so that you're aware of the risks, and then it's your decision. I told you the risks of getting an IV, but if you continue getting IVs, I'm not going to judge you for it. Go nuts. So nuts again. He just thinks we just stupid. we're saying nuts again. Go nuts. Oh, go nuts. Go nuts. Go nuts. Go nuts. This is the podcast of go nuts. Okay. Can I we think call your wazoo that? is right around the corner from your gonads. <laughs> is uh, taint a, me a medical term? It's not a medical term, but I think it refers to the perineum, which is the area in between the testicles and the anus. But uh, you don't use the word taint. Correct. Perineum. Sounds like a jackass term. It is. They would say taint. Well, if they shoot a dart at your taint. I say taint. Right. What? I say taint. It's Why? Com common language. <laughs> Why? Why do you say that? Because I don't say perineum. Um, I don't know. Is there something you, you want to promote? I say potato. Is there something you want to promote? Our podcast that we're going to do? I'm going to do your podcast. Yeah. I find you incredibly intelligent, incredibly likable, incredibly um, successful. I, I think that you- Do you uh, find him sexy, Dad? Um, uh, no, I don't, <laughs> but I would imagine- It's because I had the donuts. 
No, I guess you are. You're very sexy. Thank you. <laughs> I feel, uh, and I don't feel uncomfortable saying that, and I'm comfortable. Right. You're very sexy. Thank you. In fact, you're the sexiest doctor in this room. Um, <laughs> the, the truth is that, uh, you see your podcast, Dr. Mike? Yeah, the Checkup with Dr. Mike. The yeah. Checkup with Dr. Mike is on a YouTube, and you're also on TikTok, and uh, are you on Threads yet? Yes. You're on Threads. You're on everything, right? Everything. Snapchat? Dr. Mike, yeah. Snapchat. I've somehow got the Dr. Mike brand locked down, which is crazy because there's a lot of Dr. Mikes out there. Do you have it locked down, though? Yeah. Did you have to copyright it? Uh, I do have Dr. Mike, doctor spelled out, uh, patented, yeah, or copyrighted, whatever it is. Dr. Have Drew has his, too. Yeah. yeah, you're sexier than Dr. <laughs> Drew. I can say oh, that. Thank you. I, and Dr. I know Drew Dr. has really big muscles now, mm -hmm. like super big muscles. Has he been working out? Mm -hmm. Really? Yeah. He's a handsome fella. Wow. Wow. Dr. Dr. Fauci, too. I mean, Brad Pitt played him in SNL. Right. Is Dr. Fauci good looking in person? I, yeah, I try to get him to take the Sexy Doctor Alive title for me because I'm the reigning. So I said, maybe I can volunteer you to be the next. He does look amazing for he his age. He turned it down though. But he looks amazing for mm -hmm. his age. Yeah, he does. Do you like him? Yeah, very likable. He's I think a Brooklyn guy. I'm, I'm, I'm a Brooklyn guy. Two Brooklyn guys, yeah. two New York guys. But I, I, I actually like him and I always felt bad for him. I felt yeah. like he became a victim. He had to come to our meeting with like security because there were death threats against his life constantly. I, I bet you he's happy to be out of the limelight. Very much so. You could see like it was weighing on him. He oh. almost cried during our, during our interview. Really? Yeah, because uh, he was getting a lot of hate during that time. And uh, I had a cardiologist friend of mine, uh, Danielle Bellardo, Dr. Danielle Bellardo, send me a message of how she was very stressed out working in the ICU during the peak pandemic times and hearing Dr. Fauci's voice in the news and the media being the, the reassuring voice that he was, how it impacted her. And I read her message to him out loud and I asked him how it made him feel. You could see him tearing up because he wasn't getting a lot of that feedback. He was getting a lot of hate. No, I know. What a, what a 180 degree turn from how he was perceived during the, uh, was it the AIDS the epidemic? Yeah. yeah. Uh, but he, he just, I think he's an amazing guy and I think he is a hero and I think he was handed a, uh, an impossible task. Yeah. And everybody in, in public office now has a, an impossible task. There's nothing he could do good. But you are now, I think what you do and what you speak on is really important. And I hope I'm not your parent. You're the exact same age as, as my kid here. I, I, I can't imagine that your uh, father is not incredibly proud of the young man and the legacy that he is giving this country and this world in the form of you, Mr. Mike McHale. And um, thank you so much for coming on. I look forward to doing your podcast and uh, I tell people to subscribe to you, subscribe to me. We have a fraction of what you have and uh, leave comments. Do you, do you sell merch? I do. I do. What, do. What do you sell? Uh, I sell a shirt that looks like you're wearing my scrubs, like the scrubs that I wear in my hospital, but it's a V-neck t-shirt instead, so you can play doctor. Oh, that's fun. So that you can have get- you And I have a chest compressions line of merchandise because I'm very passionate about people learning CPR. In fact, in LAX, I've partnered with the American Heart Association. There's a kiosk with a CPR dummy with my face that teaches you how to perform chest compressions. It's all over the United States. There's like 16 airports that have it. So we should look for that. It's the yeah, Dr. Learn how, Mike. Yeah, learn how to do CPR in uh, the American Heart Association. She knows how, CPR right? Because as a yes. teacher, didn't you have to learn that? Every other year, yeah. Yeah, yeah you have to learn BLS, that. BLS, right? You're BLS certified? Maybe. Mm. But I haven't taught in a while, so I'm not anymore. She's retired. She's a podcaster now. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> Went yeah. from teaching and to an podcasting. Well, and you definitely influence. need to know how to do chest compressions as a podcaster. If yeah. you ask hard questions. Too. Well, really? But these weren't hard questions, but you're a very- You asked me about vaginal tightening and snail we didn't ask this you was about. Hard. We didn't ask you about a prolapse. That's you could true. have done that. They could have asked me about I got that. in trouble posting prolapses last year. I didn't know what it was. You were posting them? I saw a picture. You can't, it's above the camera. Don't pan to it. Okay. But above camera, I saw that, that, mm -hmm. and I didn't know what that was. And I posted it on TikTok, and I trended worldwide. Wow! I thought it was some sort of cupcake. Mm. But apparently, not only have I learned that, I went on the H. Do you know Ethan Klein? Yeah. On the H three mm -hmm. podcast, and he showed me. He brought on an, a guy who can do it. It's mm. not even a medical issue. To him, it's a talent. Yeah, some people can do that. And do it for pleasure. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> I mean, people do a lot of things for pleasure. I mean, I've had some really unique experiences in the emergency room of people putting 
objects in their bodies that don't belong there. So what's the weirdest uh-huh. thing you've ever found in there? Um, it wasn't what I found. I saw it sticking out a pipe cleaner outside of a, a urethra of a man's genitalia. A pipe. A pipe you know, cleaner. those like for arts and crafts. Yeah. Well, so that was, a, was it an arts and craft project that this guy was, uh, uh, it was a pleasurable attempt that now you don't know he was just cleaning. Like sometimes you think, Oh my God, I've been with my urethra. It's been like, I haven't scrubbed it in months. We talked you about don't need to Ari, scrub self cleaning. Ari Shafir. Just we like the vagina. A, Pardon me? What? Just like the vagina. <laughs> the vagina is self cleaning. Anyone who's selling you cleaning products for your vagina is you shouldn't it's a scam. Are you saying don't douche? Yeah. And don't be a douche. That's even more important. Wait a minute. But there's a whole industry on douches. Look at that. More industries that we're taking down, more sponsorships we're losing. What about just for a fresh <laughs> odor? Doesn't. Nope. No, a vagina should smell like a vagina. Sponsorships a for vagina, a vagina should smell like a vagina. And you know, is that your is opening weird. line on a date? Gwyneth Paltrow sells a candle that smells like, like a, a vagina. vagina. Yes, yeah. interesting. Just don't that's all that you, you're just leaving. Yeah, it? I'm, I'm like, you're just putting what? that on the table. Correct. <laughs> really? Do you have those candles? No. As a single man, don't you think it'd be? It, it's like when somebody. If you walks walk into, into a doctor's office and there's a candle that smells like Gwen's vagina, mm-hmm. walk out. That's a piece of medical advice I'm I have with. an infuser that smells like my gonads. <laughs> <laughs> diffuser. What? Diffuser. It's a diffuser? I think so. Is it a diffuser or an infuser? Diffuser. Diffuser. Oh, I don't know. I didn't know. I don't know. I just know it smells like my gonads. <laughs> anyway, I was trying to wrap this podcast up. <laughs> All right. Sorry. All right. No, no, it's okay. We're going to be doing your podcast. Thank you so much, Dr. Thank Mike. You. This has been really interesting, informative, entertaining, and uh, hopefully the beginning of a friendship. Ah, I hope so. I do. All right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That was good. You are great. And you're pretty, you really, I like your, I love your philosophy.